This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. I have a lesson in being Southern for those of you who came from off. People in every region of the country practice sitting. All Americans sit down to supper or to work or to break beans. Southerners also practice the ancient art of setting. Setting is sitting with a definite purpose of doing nothing. There is setting on the porch at the end of the day when the chores are done, setting on the dock to fish, or setting and thinking. The most important part of setting is the nothing that you want from the experience. 21st century American life is marked by too much intensity and not enough nothing. Somehow we have been taught that everything we do, every minute we are awake, everything must be done with great intensity. The truth is that we do not need two more hours in the day. Most folks just need a little rest. We Americans set out to conquer our careers with all our might. Competition for the best schools and jobs is intense all the way down to middle school. Little kids' ball leagues have had to stop keeping score. Not because the children are bothered by winning and losing, but because the parents are. It is not unusual that the children who sign up to play in community athletic leagues must get their parents to sign a covenant that they will behave. That is what intensity does to otherwise nice people. By the time the kids get to college, they know their chances of getting into the best schools and winning the best scholarships are slim. Therefore, they push as hard as they can to win the coveted places in the distant class. And then we have to find the right job, of course. Do not think you can take your time to settle into the job. You must work harder than the next person to win the promotion you already have your eye on. And it does not matter the career or the job or the work that you do. They are all pretty much the same intense. Achieving is the only option. As B. Davy Napier said in his poem, okay, Yahweh, let's recapitulate. In certain areas, we've achieved finesse, sophistication beyond imagination. But God, what most we need, we haven't got. We land people on the moon, our computers are a boon, but we can't transform the ugly faces of our city's vilest places. We've got ready to release what it takes to make wars cease. What ain't we got, we ain't got peace. We've got skill to sight the blind, ways to heal the fractured mind while we covet a neighbor's house and we sleep with neighbor's spouse. We've got God in heaven above and the voice of turtle dove. What ain't we got? We ain't got love. Not only is our world marked by intensity, all this intensity has left us with a troubled world and deep inside our souls the feeling that life is still somehow incomplete. What does God have for us that we might employ to heal this world and this life of ours? No need to throw up our hands and declare nothing can be done. God has something deep and life-giving, and God will gladly give it to any who will use it. As we consider the answer to this question, let's listen as our parish adult choir sings for us how firm a foundation our soloist is Jamie Anderson.
In worship a few weeks ago, we baptized a baby. That familiar service set into motion a long string of events. As a result of that baptism, the membership secretary had a job to do. The church membership record has been brought up to date. The altar guild had to make sure the baptismal font was ready. They take great care to see that the water is fresh and just the right temperature. Preachers tell stories among themselves about the day they went to baptize a new soul into the family of God, but found the font dry. A moment like that forms the basis for one of the nightmares that wakes us up in the middle of the night. We have to make sure the font is ready. The conference statistician will record the event in the year-end report. Walgreens will be printing the pictures that will be sent to the family that could not join us for the big day. One single moment in a church service on a Sunday morning causes all that commotion in all these places and more. Welcoming a baby into the church family really is quite a big deal. Most likely I've left out a few steps. But when this list of steps is complete, it has hardly touched the importance of the moment. You see, the greater importance of the moment that we baptize is that God has placed into our hands this new, the, the, the power to welcome this new soul into the family of God. We declare that what we do here is of eternal significance. The baby or the adult now baptized is bound into the church family, a child of God. God has placed this authority into our hands. In the same way, the bread we share at the communion table is not merely a once monthly chore that someone has to do. It is our resharing the Last Supper as Jesus shared it with his disciples in the upper room. Those who prepare the altar are preparing the table where the church will meet the living Christ again. Divine grace in our hands. Just as Jesus connected that broken bread with his soon to be broken body, we will again connect the broken bread with his body broken on the cross. Divine grace in human hands. Just as Jesus took the loaves and the fishes from the young boy, gave thanks to God, and then fed the multitudes, so each soup kitchen team takes simple stuff and cooks up a feast for those who come hungry. It is necessary calories, sure. But more than a dirty dish at the end of the day, the soup kitchen team shares this miracle of Christ again and again with the hungry at our doorstep. Divine grace is served on plastic trays. In all of these ordinary ways, we have been given by God's hands full of divine grace, which we offer and share with others. Ordinary water, ordinary bread, ordinary food offered in Christ's name becomes divine grace offered from our hands. We have the power to offer the grace of God. You have the power to offer the grace of God. We exercise this divine grace, this blessing with human hands. Too often grace is understood narrowly as God's redemptive and liberating power that claims a sinner for God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It is surely that, but it is much more. As Paul told the Corinthians, the young church at Macedonia found the grace to give generously to the church in Jerusalem. They found generosity even as they were suffering severe trials and poverty. As Paul said, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Too often, we wait to give until we are rich enough. As soon as I win the lottery, then I'll have, I'll have plenty to give to others. As soon as I've saved up enough, then I can be generous with those who have less. Focusing on our scarcity, we never have enough and we never will. The stewardship committee went to visit with a the farmer. They got right to the point, if you had $200, would you give $100 to the Lord? Sure would, said the farmer. If you had two cows, would you give one of them to the Lord? Of course, replied the farmer. If you had two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord? That's not fair, the farmer growled. You know I have two pigs. When we focus on what we have, we have something to share. The grace of generosity neither depends on the size of our bank accounts nor on any sense that we have enough, whatever that means. 
Generosity is a grace for every time in our lives. Generosity is a grace that shares what it can, giving according to our ability, not according to our abundance. Paul urged the church at Corinth to consider the possibility that their gift might be the grace of God that the church in Jerusalem needed to receive. Consider it grace that you give to help others. Consider it divine grace in our hands. Grace was not merely what the Macedonians gave. They received grace by their giving. Who would have thought that we are blessed by the blessings that we give to others? But I run across people all the time who are blessed through what they give. I compliment them on a, on a job well done, but they brush it aside, claiming that they are the ones who have received the most. Early in their marriage, Billy and Ruth Graham were visiting a church where he was to be the guest preacher. During the offering, an usher came to the platform and pushed the offering plate in front of him. Billy reached for his wallet, pulled out what he thought was a $1 bill. As it dropped into the plate, he saw it was his one and only $10 bill. His heart sank as he saw the bulk of his financial resources disappearing into the church coffers. To add insult to injury, the church did not give him an honorarium for preaching at the service that night. On the way home, he told Ruth what had happened. But instead of sympathizing, she said, and just think, the Lord will only give you credit for the one dollar. That is all you meant to give. Remember the complaint. The church is always asking for money. Frequently, frequently we hear these words as an accusation against the church. On the contrary, in fact, those words are a very high compliment. I'm glad my church needs money. If it didn't, it, it would mean it wasn't interested in spreading the good news and had no hope to give away. I'm glad my church needs money. If it didn't, it would mean it wasn't interested in teaching children, in inviting in those who do not have a faith community or welcoming new folks. Thus, it would mean that the church had no future. Yes, I'm glad my church needs money. The fact that it does need money means that it has not forfeited its zeal, its compassion, its concern, its evangelism, and its future. The vision is still there, searching for the place as God is calling us forward to be. My church needs my gifts, and I'm glad I wouldn't want to be a member of any other kind. The point that kept catching our attention in Bible study this week was found in verse 4. Entirely on their own, they, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. We found ourselves amazed at that claim. Really? They pleaded for the privilege of sharing in this offering? They were that anxious to give of what little they had to a church they would never visit? On reflection, the claim does not seem so far-fetched. Somehow we read this part of the passage and leap back to the position of scarcity that we've already addressed. Whenever we hear of another's need and respond from our position of our own scarcity, then anything seems like too much, and their need seems too far away to require my attention. Thus, the claim that the Macedonians urgently pleaded with Paul to join the offering strains belief. If we're convinced that our resources are scarce, then disbelief is the logical response. On the other hand, if we begin from the conviction that we are rich in all the ways that matter in this world and in the world to come, then their urgent pleading to be part of this offering is the expected response. We stand in Christ, you and I. We have peace with God. We have treasure beyond, beyond counting in heaven where it cannot decay or be lost. We have brothers and sisters joyously standing with us in this life and in the life to come. We have the wisdom of God as we deal with this world's challenges. We have the vision of a world held lovingly in the hands of God. You bet we're anxious to be part of anything that God is part of. We are the richest people in the world in all the ways that matter. This conviction is God's grace to us. It is the grace of God which we are happy then to share. It is the grace of God in human hands, like our hands. Now, usually we've read the scripture long before this, 
but I wanted to prepare us to hear a passage from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. We've been talking about grace. In this passage, Paul is talking with the Corinthians about completing an offering for the, for, for the Jerusalem church that was suffering and in great want. In this passage, he uses the Greek word usually translated great Greek grace many times, but he uses the term in several ways. It has become quite a rich word in Paul's vocabulary, and I thought we should talk about the many meanings of grace before we read so we could be watching for Paul's rich understanding of the word. If you would, turn with me now, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, We will be reading from verse 1 in the NIV translation, but in each case where the Greek word for grace is found, I'm going to read every time the English word grace. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the grace of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love of God we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich." And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were not only first to give, but also to have a desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who has gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Let us offer grace to God, who put it into the heart of Titus, the same concern I have for you. It is all grace carried in human hands like ours. When God pours out grace upon the church, amazing things happen. I'm going to ask you to repeat along with me. These are the things that happen. Barriers are broken. Communities are formed. Opposites are reconciled. Unity is established. Disease is cured. Addiction is broken. Cities are renewed. Races are reconciled. Hope is established. People are blessed. And the church happens. Today, the grace of God is being poured out and we're going to have church. So be ready. Get ready. God is up to something. And discouraged folks, cheer up. Dishonest folks, fess up. Sour folks, sweeten up. Closed folk, open up. Gossipers, shut up. Convicted folks, make up. Sleeping folks, wake up. Lukewarm folk, fire up. Dry bones, shake up. And pew potatoes, stand up. And most of all, Christ, the Savior of the world, is lifted up. Divine grace is offered by human hands like ours. Well, now let us listen as our harpist Ann Jackson plays that beautiful hymn, I Will Arise.
What an incredible gift God has given to us, us as Christians, us as God's church, that we hold divine grace in human hands, like Ann Jackson who with her hands makes that incredible music that calls us back into the presence of God, divine grace in human hands. I'd like to extend an invitation this morning that you join us for worship at Church Street. Our Sunday worship is at 8.30 and 11 a.m. in the nave, a beautiful place to gather, a beautiful sound as we lift our voices in song. I invite you to come. Also, a communion on Wednesday at noon. Come and be part of that worship service. Well, now I am Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. Now, as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye, then understand you've just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Thank you.